It is here at the beginning of the last century that the great inventor Nikolai Tesla built a tower with which he hoped to transmit electric power all over the world. That giant tower was torn down in 1917, but Tesla's laboratory, which was alongside it, designed by his friend, famed architect Stanford White, still remains. And there's a big effort underway to try to make it a museum and science center celebrating Tesla and his work. Nikola Tesla was a giant, the man behind the establishment of alternating current, which is at the foundation of how the world became electrified. He invented much in the way of how radio signals are transmitted and fluorescent lighting and the bladeless turbine and on and on. The son of Serbian parents, he came to the United States in 1894 with four cents. Well, he came with four cents, but he also came with a mind full of ideas. He was chock full of those. He had a wonderful visual ability to um, conceive of something and then carry that idea into a reality. When he developed the alternating current motors, it was a visualization of what, um, what it would be, and then he was able to create it. So Tesla was more than just um, someone who was a scientist, but he was a, a visionary. You know, you can think of him in that way as well. He carried um, his work from the, the conception through all the way to the realization. And here on Long Island, in that laboratory, uh, right over there where there used to be this huge tower, what was he doing? He was trying to develop what he called his world wireless system. And it was a, uh, an idea that he would not only be communicating with, um, with the, the kind of communications that we did with telephone or words, but he, he envisioned that we would be able to transmit um, pictures and images and um, sound. It was, uh, and beyond that, it was going to be transmission of energy. He wanted to not just have a communication center, but a whole energy center. It was, a, it was a world wireless communications and energy center that he envisioned for this spot. And how would this spot, here we are, Shoreham, Long Island, how would the energy be generated? Well, he had this uh, huge tower um, that was part of the whole system. And some people look at it as a big Tesla coil, but the energy would be coming from the Earth. And you, I'm not a scientist, but the scientists among us can explain um, Tesla's, or what they believe Tesla's uh, goals were and how he intended to tap the energy of the Earth. Um, it had to do with resonance and, and the, the, the um, energy that's inherent in the Earth. And he, he had a, um, a concept and an understanding of the way the, the Earth worked and the way energy could be transferred in a way that was way ahead of his time, something that people today are beginning to uh, investigate. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's beyond me, but um, I know that, that there are people working on those concepts today. Jane, you're the president of the Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe. Wardenclyffe is, is what this is, what, what it was all called, Wardenclyffe. Right. You're trying to preserve it. You're trying to save it. How are you doing? Well, we're plugging along. This has been a long journey, and we still have a ways to go. Uh, primarily, our biggest obstacle is fundraising. It's the one thing that always is an obstacle for any um, small group, uh, which ours is, but um, we're working at it. And we're looking for um, collaborators in this effort. We'd love to have people who have an interest um, in seeing this national and international treasure saved. We'd love to see people even don't make small donations, larger ones if they can. Um, we'd, we're looking for benefactors, investors, anyone who thinks they can help us make this difference. This is a site that deserves saving. It's more than something just for the local people to look at and say, oh yeah, we saved this little piece of property. It's really something that I think worldwide has significance. Tesla was uh, a visionary, as I said before. He was an important component of the whole transformation of the world from a pre-electrical society into one that depends on it uh, for our daily living. And uh, we, we really owe it to him, to his memory and to his legacy to save this. People over, all over the world recognize Tesla's importance, 
and I think it's time that Americans do. Discuss some of the contributions of Tesla. Tesla contributed to us in many, many ways, uh, and he looked at what he did as being important for people. What he did was done for um, for the common man, for the average American. Um, he he's uh, I can't say the quote exactly, but in essence, he said that science, if it doesn't have an application to what uh, is necessary for humans, is a perversion of itself. And he's also quoted as saying that. Um, what they do now is is theirs, meaning the scientists of his time. But what I worked, but the future for which I really worked is mine. So, uh, and I think that's coming true. But in any case, to get back to your question, he had um, obviously alternating current, which affects us every day. He had his alternating current also is part of, uh, and his his inventions related to that are um, a part of our electronic ignition systems. He's, um, so the, we, there's, there's another everyday use. Uh, fluorescent lighting, um, brushless turbine, um, remote control. When you, when you turn on your television with that remote control, that's an offshoot of what Tesla was doing with radio and with, with the remote control teleautomaton that he created. The tele teleautomaton was this little boat that he had out in the sound, or that he actually used in sound, originally demonstrated at Madison Square Garden. But it was the first demonstration of radio. And using a remote control box, he was able to control the movements of this little boat. And up until that time, no one had done that. So he recognized and understood that you could send a signal and receive a signal. And um, the, the receiver would be attuned to his um, uh, transmitter. And nowadays children play with those little remote control cars. That's Tesla's teleautomaton in a modern form. So um, radio, he, the, the Supreme Court um, of the United States of America uh, determined that Tesla is the father of radio. Not Marconi. Not Marconi. Marconi was using 17 of Tesla's patents. So um, when you, in, in so many realms, ways that um, we don't think of but we um, we use every day, Tesla had an influence. When you're using your cell phone, what Tesla did years ago with radio and transmission of energy and, and um, well, not energy, but radio signal, um, what he did then was the formative work that led to what we're able now to use in our cell phones. How could people join with you in this effort, contribute to your efforts? Well, we certainly would welcome um, any investors or benefactors or contributors, they can check our website, www.teslasciencecenter.org. We have a PayPal button on there. You can contribute that way. Um, you can communicate with us through the website. You can write to us at Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe, Post Office Box 552, Shoreham, New York, 11786. Um, and you can also call me. My number is 631-929-8685. We're happy to communicate with people any way they choose. And we're certainly uh, welcoming anyone's interest and their donations and help that way. Chris, you're a physicist. That's right. In layman's words, could you explain what Tesla was trying to do here on Long Island, here in Shoreham? Well, Tesla was very interested in uh, wireless transmission of uh, signals, but also of then energy. And to the extent that we understand today, what he probably did was he was thinking of uh, using the earth as a giant cello. And you pluck the strings, you uh, bring the vibrations into the instrument, and part of it leaks out into the environment. In the cello, we hear the sound, like in any string instrument. And I think based on what we know about what he did at the time, it looks like he was trying to bring the whole Earth into electrical resonance. And then at different places around the Earth, place receivers that could suck the, uh, suck the energy uh, from this reservoir and make it uh, locally available. So his thinking was done that there would not be just one shower, uh, tower of Shoreham, but there would be several, many around the world that would contribute everywhere where there was a lot of energy source like uh, Niagara Falls, Iguazu Falls in Brazil, etc. And then this charge, this resonating body of the Earth would then be able to transmit the energy around the world and make it locally accessible with an attuned receiver. 
In some ways, he was thinking very much along uh, lines of resonances, and he was bringing that in at a time when uh, electrical resonances were just being uh, used, for example, in radio to transmit signals. In terms of modern physics, this is a century later, those theories, do they make any sense? Well, resonating theory certainly makes sense because essentially all wireless transmission is based on that. Uh, we also know in the mechanical systems, uh, a body of a certain length begins to vibrate. We know that when we have a car where the tires are not fully rotated and they are a little out of balance, then we begin feeling it at a certain speed when the wire hits the ground always in that resonance interval. So we are very familiar with that. But to apply it to that extent for the wireless transmission, that is still a challenge today. And the research is just being picked up again at certain uh, at some labs to find out what what it really entails to transmit uh, energy wirelessly at the amount that Tesla was perceiving. Whether or not was that was feasible to uh, produce to disseminate uh, to deliver all of the energy electrical energy that we need today is an open question. Probably not. But at his time, it was certainly a revolutionary. Now here on Long Island in Shoreham, you had the tower. It was nearly 200 feet tall. You had the laboratory next door, and there was this uh, power supply facility here as well. And then there were tunnels underneath. The story is that they were copper-lined. I mean, how, do, how does all that work together to, to do what he wanted to do? Well, the tower, uh, the tower base is established. We have, uh, it is still available on site. It was eight uh, pillars. The octagon is still on the ground, so that we know. The tower base going down the shaft into the, uh, underneath the earth, uh, as a resonating uh, facility, that is something that has been covered up over the years, so we cannot dig down into it. But the stories about towers, uh, about tunnels, persist underneath the tower. They have not been found. This, uh, perhaps with today's uh, ground searching technology, one can do that at some point. And this might be something we would be interested in if we were to have the building and reestablish the, uh, the museum here to see what, what truth is to that. Uh, to all accounts, one could imagine that these uh, tunnels at the base of the tower, about um, s several tens of feet under the ground, would be something like a reflector on an antenna. Uh, it's something one has to look into more carefully, so the idea is not out of uh, the world. But to what extent uh, they match with the uh, stories that we hear uh, told by locals is something we have to leave to future exploration. In the pantheon of great scientists, where, as a scientist yourself, would you say Tesla fits? Tesla certainly fits within uh, the, the most important of them, simply because of his vision. He also had the practical sense of uh, delivering something that was useful for humanity. After all, the alternating current system is what has established itself, and he understood that this would come. Uh, he probably was uh, ahead of his thinking that he didn't even think too much about his personal gain from that because he knew it would come and would be established, so he was not concerned about that. Unfortunately, his own uh, um, business model, as we would call it today, was such that uh, he, he put the philanthropy a little bit ahead of the, uh, uh, of, of the financing. And in the end, uh, a disagreement of opinions in that regard led to uh, the demise of this wonderful uh, experiment here. He certainly, at the time of turn of the la that century, at the beginning of the uh, 20th century, early um, 1900s, he was certainly in line with other uh, giants. And uh, we, of course, know that there's Edison with his enormous uh, industrial, um, uh, industrial um, virtues. There is uh, Marconi, who later on uh, by using some of uh, Tesla's knowledge, uh, was able to bring um, radio transmissions to the, to the mainstream. Um, Tesla certainly fits in there. He's also probably one of the last uh, singular, uh, single-handed inventors. Uh, inventions today take many people to, uh, um, to have, to make, and to bring into the market. Tesla probably was unique because uh, he was one of the people who could do it all, think it out, and turn it into something useful and uh, prove that it works. Dr. Forster, what does Tesla mean to you as, as a physicist? Well, he was, he's well known to physicists, maybe not as much to the community as a whole, but he is well known as to physicists. His name is associated with a unit of uh, magnetic field, the Tesla. And right now, He's being used 
to promote science education. If you go to the American Physical Society website, uh, you will find some information, some activity books, some comic books that, that use Tesla to inspire kids to be interested in science, to do some science things. And so I, I think I'm, I'm interested in the vision of this place being a pl place to inspire people, children, adults, a place to, to and a place to play and do some activities. I mean, it's supposed to be a center, not just a museum, but a center where we can recognize Tesla and, uh, and, and then learn as, as a, to be interested in the science that he sort of promoted. Describe his, uh, his position. I would put him up in the upper half, maybe a scale of, say, eight out of one to ten, maybe. Uh, and ten would be the highest. And ten being highest, yes. Uh -huh. How come people, I mean, I would think the average school child on Long Island where he worked here, I would think that most school children all across the country know nothing about Tesla. I'm like, why? You know, I, th I think we're, we're, that is a mistake, that we're trying to correct that now. We are having some uh, efforts to put Tesla in the curriculum because he was important. And there, there is an interesting story of, say, the, the war of the currents. And this was exploited in some of the ma educational material that you can find on the American Physical Society website, where uh, Tesla and Edison were competing to light up the World's Fair in 1892, 93. And Tesla won out. He, he uh, won the contract to light the, this World's Fair. And he did it, of course, with his alternating current. And, but, but he went head on with, with Edison, who had some strong backing as well. Tesla, in fact, uh, worked for Edison when he first came to the United States. He was introduced as uh, in a letter saying that uh, I know two important scientists. You are one of them, meaning Edison, and this young man, Tesla, is, is another. Tesla died in 1943 in the New Yorker Hotel, penniless. What does this say about science and scientists and how, how both are, are treated in in society. Tesla, like many brilliant people, many scientists and artists and others, uh, was an eccentric. And maybe he, uh, maybe that says something about his eccentricity, that he did not go out to continue to push in the way that he had done to get the money and the funding to do what he, he wanted to do. State Assemblyman Mark Alessi, you represent the district in which the, uh, the laboratory is located and you went to where Tesla was from, you landed in, what was the name of the airport? Tesla Airport, Nikola Tesla Airport in uh, Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, it was part of uh, a fellowship that I took part in that studied transatlantic relations but uh, Belgrade, Serbia was one of the destinations where I was to study Eastern Europe. And when asked what topic uh, would be a good topic for me to, uh, to study, I brought up uh, Nikola Tesla, his history, his legacy there, and innovation. And I was able to meet with the science minister. I was able to meet with the director of the lab. And I tried to lay a foundation, letting them know that uh, this lab was within my district. Uh, that I am uh, very much in favor of, of preserving it. And once that's done, there's a very active group here, the Friends of Tesla, that would love to have some kind of working relationship with the uh, museum that's already existing so that, again, there can be some, some sort of synergy to make sure that his uh, legacy is preserved. Now, if he's not that well known in what became his, his country, I mean, he came here, he was in his 20s and died in his 80s, uh, there is a great deal of knowledge about Tesla back in the old country. There is, and what's really remarkable is the country that he spent 20 years of his life in, 
continue to celebrate his his innovations that he basically made here when he was in the United States, what people have to realize is Tesla at the same time was an American through and through. He, he really uh, honored and appreciated his U.S. citizenship to the point where when some of his inventions, uh, when other countries were trying to buy it for their military, he refused. Even when the U.S. military denied uh, uh, his request to uh, buy his inventions, he refused to sell his inventions to other countries because he felt that, you know, it would... Uh, to value his what he his prized the possession of U.S. citizenship. There's a museum that you've uh, a museum to Tesla there. Yes, it's the Nikola Tesla Museum. Um, it's a multi-leveled museum with a number of the original uh, inventions that uh, the smaller inventions. For example, you could see the remote control boat that uh, he invented that actually operated right out here on the Long Island Sound. Um, they, uh, there, there are a number of artifacts that are here in the United States that would, it would be wonderful to uh, be housed right here in this uh, museum that we're going to have behind me. But if there is a working relationship between the two museums, I think uh, it would be a whole lot more productive. And his picture is on currency there? That's right. Uh, when I came back from uh, Serbia, I came back with uh, Nikola Tesla bills. And I still have a few of them left that whenever it looks like there's somebody that is really passionate about uh, preserving this lab behind me, uh, I make sure that they have a copy of that currency. It would be great if uh, you know, some of that currency can be used to help preserve this lab. I didn't bring that much back because it was my own money. He is such an important part of the culture in Serbia, and I think he should be a very important part of our culture here. If we're the innovators worldwide, and this is where we want to drive our economy forward, we need to know where we came from, and this is it. When did you first learn about Tesla? When I was first moving into the village, a number of the residents uh, started talking about this lab and uh, the future of what this property would be. And there was a certain passion amongst the residents. Again, you know, some of them who just grew up in Shoreham and heard all of the stories from their parents and their grandparents about what happened here or what relationship they had. Uh, you know, certain some some uh, of my friends' uh, great grandmothers ice skated on the top of the Tesla Tower in the, in the winter. So there's some you know, remarkable stories. But when I learned about uh, his history and how important he was, this is a whole lot more than just this community, uh, although it's very important to this community and the history of this community. And like I said, uh, Shoreham, when it was getting planned and developed, uh, at the end of its train stop from New York City, they felt that researchers would come here uh, and, and summer here, and it would be a certain culture of, of again, research and innovation uh, during the Industrial Revolution. Well, it's still happening. And uh, I don't know if that's happenstance and coincidence or if it's just the legacy of what had started here over 100 years ago, but there are still a number of researchers here. Now they work at Brookhaven National Lab. Maybe one day they'll work on another part of this property as well if there's a partnership between Brookhaven National Lab and, and this museum. But... Uh, there is a strong will in this community to preserve this lab. There's a strong will throughout the United States. I've seen people contacting us on the internet. Uh, once people know about Tesla, and that's why it's important that we preserve this and people get to know about him, they become, first of all, passionate about what he has done, and they come, become passionate about possibility and, and the fact that human imagination, what can be imagined, can be accomplished. And I think he's a testament to that, and I think that's what gets people excited about his legacy. I grew up uh, four houses from uh, the house that Nikola Tesla lived in uh, when he was here at the laboratory. He had a, a little bungalow on the uh, bluff in Shoreham, and I, I grew up four houses away. And uh, Nikola Tesla, as a child for me, became part of my DNA because people in town would tell stories, uh, firsthand stories, secondhand stories. Uh, I remember one story from an older gentleman who was a small child at the time that Nikola Tesla lived in Shoreham, and uh, he saw an old man standing on the older man standing on the bluff with a box with levers on it, and he was looking out over the sound. And uh, my friend Wes Oliver, who uh, it was 92 at the time he told me the story, uh, indicated that he went up to this gentleman and asked what he was doing, and he said, "We'll take a look out out on the sound." and he was running his remote control boat up and down the sand, and the year was probably about 1906 or so, and nothing like that existed anywhere in the world, and as a little boy he was fascinated, but that, those are the kind of stories that permeated my growing up, 
and I was always fascinated with Nikola Tesla and as time went on I got involved in the commercial real estate business and this became uh, one of those properties that people over and over have considered trying to develop for various reasons and it became a passion of mine that this has to be preserved and it has to be uh, committed to science, science research, uh, a museum for what Tesla created, the many, many things that he created. I know some of my colleagues have mentioned some of his inventions. There are more. He uh, took the first x-ray photograph three years before Rentgen. He developed the first um, uh, bladeless turbine, uh, instrumental research in robotics. Uh, he did um, uh, some other really important uh, uh, inventions as well uh, that people don't radio, for example. Uh, the, new, uh, the, state Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court recognized that he, he, rather than Marconi, was the father of radio uh, in a court case that was decided after his death. And uh, people think that Marconi invented the radio. He invented the radio with 17 of, of Tesla's patents, which I, f I find fascinating. But from a real estate point of view, this particular property is a fascinating piece of property <clears throat> in that it sits in the shadow of other scientific institutions that are here in Suffolk County. Uh, if you start with uh, Cold Spring, Harbor Laboratory and you move uh, east to Stony Brook University. Between Stony Brook University and Brookhaven National Lab you have this vacant piece of property and uh, as we have uh, determined that there is an interest uh, hopefully from Brookhaven Lab and also from the SUNY system to establish some sort of uh, science related facility here along with us so that the museum would not only be a static museum celebrating the past but would become a living, breathing, uh, scientific community uh, celebrating the future, which is, of course, the greatest legacy that you could pay to, uh, the greatest tribute, rather, that you could pay to Nikola Tesla, because he was all about the future. He was never about the past. He was always about the future, and that's what this property represented to me. So I made it uh, my personal goal to try to become involved and see what I could do from a real estate standpoint to help preserve this property because it's such an important, as all my other colleagues have said, it's such an important international um, uh, piece of science history uh, that I think we can weave into the fabric of science today. And that's what, that's what really excites me, is being able to do both of those things on one piece. How do you explain the lack of knowledge by most Americans, I'd say, most Long Islanders indeed, about Tesla? We live in a commercial world. We live in a, in a world that celebrates commercial fame. And uh, Thomas Edison is a household word in every community and every textbook that we ever grew up in. Uh, Nikola Tesla is not. The simple difference in my mind, uh, having uh, read a good deal about the, the history of the two men whose lives were intertwined early on uh, and who, who competed uh, throughout their whole lives. Uh, it's interesting to note that Nikola Tesla's um, development of the alternating current distribution system far outweighs the importance of the direct current system that uh, Thomas Edison advocated and yet Thomas Edison is the man that's recognized as the most important inventor and most important scientist of his time. Uh, I believe that the difference is in uh, the success of the commercialization of his inventions. He had, Nikola Tesla had absolutely no interest in commercializing any of his and no ability to even understand the process. He didn't have the thirst, he didn't have the fire to commercialize his, his inventions. Will this historic laboratory and site be saved? You can help. Get in touch with the Tesla Science Center. It's at www.teslasciencecenter.com on the internet. Join in the effort to save this place. Thank you for watching. I'm Carl Grossman on WVVH-TV.